Welcome to another scriptural study. In fact, another scriptural topical study where we together as one will ask the most important question that anyone can ask. What does the scripture say is the leading cause of death? Again, isn't this the most important question any of us could ask in our short lifetimes? We're going to go over four other topics as well. Number one, when and why was death introduced? Two, what is the cosmic battle and the collateral damage that surrounds it? Three, what is the scriptural second death? And finally, four, when will death be finally eliminated? What is indeed the good news of great joy that surrounds the time period when death will be eliminated. So on to the study. What does the scripture say is the leading cause of death? Well, let's start off by looking at how world, the world and its world religions actually attempt to answer that question without the scriptures. So, yeah, you know, the Lord Shah Baal movements, including Hebrew and Messianic movements. How would they answer the question? So the test is, and we always say to people, don't trust us, get out there and test and prove for yourself. So if you asked 99.99% of the population still imprisoned in world religious mindsets, how would they possibly answer? Well, in most cases, most that do not utilize the scriptures will go to the medical community. They will go to the medical community to give them the answer. They won't go to the scriptures. They won't allow scripture to interpret scripture. They will ignore line upon line, here a little, there a little. And they will go to the caduceus, or the rod of Asclepius. Please study out these two symbols. Because... The World Health Organization carries those symbols. And the top 10 reasons uh, or leading causes of death from a world mindset is usually revolving around heart disease, cancers, diabetes, etc. So these are the top 10. The source is from the World Health Organization and the Global Health Estimates. So what's so wrong with that, you might ask? Well, let's talk about it in this format. Treating the symptom and not the cause of death will not, the sol will not solve the problem of death. Take a look at these top 10 from a world mindset, a world religious mindset. These are the symptoms of death and not the causes. These are the symptoms of death, not the root cause of death. So I'll say that again. These top 10 causes of death are the symptoms of death and not the causes of death. So let's ask the most important question of all once again. What does the scripture say is the leading cause of death? Well, we go to Romans chapter 6 verse 23. For the wages of sin is death. Okay, that is one scriptural source, and it's the writings of Shaul. And remember, the many are trying to eliminate, dispose, if you will, of the writings of Shaul. So let's get two or three more witnesses to establish this matter. Well, we go to the very first book of scripture in Bereshith, or Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, and I quote, But do not eat the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Once you eat from the tree of knowledge, you will know good and evil. You, you will know what sin is at that moment in time. For in that day that you eat of it, you shall certainly die. Once you know what sin is, you then will be responsible for what is known as the death penalty. The prophet Ezekiel shares it in chapter 18, verse 4, in this manner. See, all beings are mine. Now this is Yahuwah talking, the Father, the self-existent one, the Father of lights. 
the being of the Father as well as the being of the Son is mine. The being that is sinning shall die. So to understand sin, you have to understand the knowledge scripturally of good and evil. Jacob states it this way in chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. But each one is enticed when he is drawn away. Well, drawn away from what? Well, drawn away from the way of Yahuwah, the commandments. Drawn away by his own desires and trapped. Then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it has been accomplished, brings forth death. Very much like the emissary Shahul had written, for the wages of sin is death. Well, can we prove it empirically, you know, with numbers? Let's take a look. Just under 110 billion people have lived and died before us. And in 2023, we surpassed the 8 billion people mark on Earth. Well, if you go to our world in data which states humanity today and humanity's past, you will notice the uh, visual shares that each grain of sand in this visualization represents 10 million people. So each grain of sand represents 10 million people. 140 million children are born every year. 14 grains of sand enter into the hourglass. We are here, right here. These 795 grains represent the 7.95 billion back in 2020. Now we're in 2023, we've surpassed 8 billion. Below in the bottom part of the hourglass, 60 million people die every year. Six grains of sand pass through the hourglass. About 110 billion people have lived and died. 10,900 grains of sand. About half the people who have ever lived in the last 2,000 years is right here. Socrates, who was killed in 399 before the Common Era, lies about in this range. Half of the dead bodies or people here are the bodies of children. Take a look at this shot or go to the visuals that are shared with you in a PDF link and study this out. The first agriculturalist lie here, only about, it states here, uh, a billion people have lived before the agricultural revolution. So 110 people lived and died before us. None of them are living now. So can we prove the writings of Jacob or Shaul? We can, can't we? We have records of it. So the wages of sin are indeed death. And Romans chapter 3 verse 23 states what? For all have sinned and all fall short of the esteem or the way of the almighty Yahuwah. Well, world population in billions from these sources, the visualcapitalist.com, and these sources here, again, from the census.gov uh, website, states the following. How much of humanity is currently alive today? So going from the past to today. When considering that 7% of all humans who have ever lived are alive today, especially when measuring across more than a thousand centuries, it's remarkable that such a large portion of humans are currently living. If we chart the recent global population explosion, though, it begins to make much more sense. So let's take a look at it. In 8000 BCE, or before the Common Era, the entire population of humans was only about 5 million, similar to the population of Boston today. Even so, the cumulative number of humans who had ever lived stood at 9 billion. Hmm, interesting. By 1 CE, or the Common Era, the world population stood at approximately 300 million, with the majority of people living in Asia. It wasn't until about 1800 that the living human population reached the 1 billion mark. And as you've noticed, 
as of 2023, that pagan year, we surpassed 8 billion people. Here in 2024, we're at approximately 8.1 billion. So all the people that have lived and died before us did indeed die. Why? Well, as per the scripture, for all have sinned and thus fallen short of the esteem of the Almighty, Almighty Yahuwah, for the wages of sin is death. Now that's from a scriptural standpoint. And there are some people will still argue it. Remember, treating the symptoms of death, not the cause of death, will not solve the problem of death. Understand root cause analysis. These are just symptoms, heart disease, cancers, and so forth. Again, the wages of sin is death. We all die due to sin. So let's take a look at the commandments. Thou shalt not have any other mighty ones before me. Well, does the world have a ton of other mighty ones before Yahuwah? Well, we do, don't we? And we worship them. The world worships them under their world religious mindsets. Lord Shah Baal movements. And we die for it. Idol worship, same scenario. Thou shalt not take the name of the Almighty Yahuwah in vain or bring it to naught or uselessness. We die for that. Remember the Sabbath day, keep it separated from what the world does. And the world does not follow the sun, moon, and stars. The very first page of scripture, it ignores it. It creates all these other calendars with intercalation that priests tell you what to do. Rather than trusting Yahuwah with all your heart, being, and mind. Honor thy father and thy mother. That's out the door. Thou shalt not kill. Wow, we have wars and rumors of war, don't we? And it's increasing. It's not decreasing. Humanity is not improving. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Well, this is on full-blown warp 5 mode. We're ramping it up. You can marry anything in this day and age. Doesn't matter anymore. And furthermore, there's no such thing as a male according to scripture or a female. That's out the door as well. Thou shall not steal. The financial system in this world is based on the non-scriptural system of usury. People are stealing from each other each and every day. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. This is on full-blown mode as well, and ever increasing each and every day. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Greed, greed of gain, is increasing at all-time highs. All of these ten things and many more in the Torah create anxiety and stress and lead to disease, which are the symptoms of being disobedient to the Father's way. It produces death. Man's ways always lead to death. And it just so happens that the medical community profits from them financially. And all because of ignorance. So, what is ignorance? Well, lack of knowledge does not mean entirely that you don't have the information. It also could mean you're rejecting scriptural information. So we'll get into that in the rest of the study. But bottom line is, out of these Ten Commandments, they produce anxiety, stress, and so forth. And they're summarized into the greatest commandment. And that is to love your father with all your heart, being, and mind. That's Yahuwah. And the last six are how to love our neighbor as ourselves. And as the world goes deeper into the pits of hell, ignoring this, we see far more wars and rumors of war, up to and including the threat of nuclear annihilation. Yes, the wages of sin do lead to death. Now, don't they? Back to Ezekiel. See, all beings are Yahuwah's. The being of the Father as well as the being of the Son is Yahuwah's. The being that is sinning shall die. My people have perished for lack of knowledge. That word lack is in Strong's entry H1086, and it means bala, to waste away scripture, the way of Yahuwah, the Ten Commandments and other commandments, the 
most important commandment, to love Yahuwah with all your heart, being and mind, let alone your neighbor as yourself, because you have rejected knowledge. So it clarifies it in Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. My people have perished because we have rejected knowledge. It's not just because of missing knowledge, we reject it. And in this day and age, with the information age and the internet, this information has been spread throughout the world already. So we're rejecting, rejecting it at such a high level, never before seen in human history. We're rejecting truth. We no longer care about two, three witnesses to establish a matter. That's the world religious mindset. It does what it wants to do. It has a desire to ignore scripture. So scripture is clear, it's plain. The leading cause of death in scripture is sin. Well, let's move on to the four other categories. When and why was death introduced? Well, again, the being that is sinning shall die. Well, when did this start to happen? When were people starting to perish for the rejection of knowledge? When did this happen? Well, we come back to the writings or epistles of Shaul, now known today as Paul. In chapter 5, verse 12 through 14, and I quote, For this reason, even as through one man, sin did enter into the world. I'll read that again. For this reason, even as through one man, sin did enter into the world, and death through sin. And thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. For until the Torah, sin was in the world. But sin is not recognized, reckoned, when there is no Torah. Again, if you take away scripture, sin is not recognized. But death reigned from Adam until Moshe, even over those who had not sinned, according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam. So let's take a look at scriptural lifespans when death was introduced, because if you go back to the years of Adam, Methuselah, Noah, Abraham, you had very high lifespans. But because people were sinning at such a high level before the flood, what had happened? Well, we come to Bereshith or Genesis chapter 6 verse 3 and Yahuwah said my spirit shall not strive with man forever in his going astray he is flesh and his day shall be 120 years well as we can see it was up to 120 during Moshe's time and then by Yahushua's time 110 or Joshua as we know that figure or scriptural character today now, some people uh, take this verse in regards to prophecy, and we get that. But, again, can we prove that the lifespan of human beings today is only 120 years? Can we prove it scripturally? Well, let's go to Psalms chapter 90, verse 10. And I quote, The days of our lives are 70 years, or if due to strength, 80 years. Yet the best of them is but toil and exertion. For it is soon cut off and we fly away. We all die because of sin. None of us can claim a complete and full lifetime of being sinless. We can't do that. We all fall short of the esteem and way of the Almighty Yahuwah, now don't we? Well, if we go to the World Bank, and again, you can find all of this online, back in 2020, the average lifespan was 72.27. <laughs> wow. Well, how did the psalmist know this would happen? The days of our lives are 70 years, or if due to strength, 80 years. Yet the best of them is but toil and exertion, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. The average is 72.27. That means with effort, some people will live to 80 and a little bit more and above, and some people will be below. The psalmist was right on to the actual statistics that exist here and now. Again, my spirit shall not strive with man forever and is going astray. 
he is flesh and in his day, his day shall be 120 years. Well, has there been anybody living over 120 years? Well, the oldest known age ever attained to date was by Jean Calment, a French woman who died in 1997 at the age of 122. Miss Calment is also the only documented case of a person living past 120 years, which many scientists had pegged as the upper limit of the human lifespan. Well, there's a lot of dispute on her documentation. Some believe it's just under 120. But the bottom line is, out of 110 billion, just under 110 billion people have lived, lived and died, you've got one possible scenario. Is the scripture powerful? It is, isn't it? Genesis chapter 6, verse 3. And Yahuwah said, My spirit shall not strive with men forever. In his going astray, he is flesh, and in his days shall be only 120 years. Pretty powerful. Profound. Well, again, the scientists uh, had stated that they pegged the upper limit of the human lifespan at 120. Well, why did they do that? In 1962, Leonard Hayflick revolutionized cell biology when he developed a telomere theory known as the Hayflick limit, which places the maximum potential lifespan of humans at 120 years, the time at which too many cells with extremely short telomeres can no longer replicate and divide. You have this X chromosome, and you've got these telomeres at the end of each of these uh, this one chromosome, this X, if you will. And for some reason, someone turned it off. Now, scientists have identified if this scenario didn't exist, you could live well beyond 120 years. So scientists are attempting to identify who turned it off at 120 years on this telomere, on this X chromosome. Now, you can study this a little further. I had the privilege and uh, advantage of having my older boy, uh, we sent him to university in London, Ontario for biology. And while we were doing scriptural studies, he came home and he shared this with us. It blew my mind, so to speak. It was profound. Science is finally catching up with scripture, but does the medical community or the scientific community take a look at Genesis chapter six, verse three? which many scientists had pegged as the upper limit of the human lifespan? Well, they know the why. They just don't accept the who that turned it off. They don't accept the scriptures now, do they? It's not part of the dialogue or the narrative. So they know how, but they're still questioning the who because they reject the truth. For my people have perished, not just for lack of knowledge, for the rejection of it. There's not one scientist and our medical community member that would go live with this. Bereshith, Genesis chapter 6, verse 3. It's too risky, right? So why? Why did Yahuwah do this? Why did he shut it off? Why did he get to the point that he said, I'll no longer strive with the flesh? Well, this brings us to what is known as the cosmic battle and the collateral damage behind the cosmic battle. And it comes back to Romans chapter 5, verse 12 through 14. For this reason, even as through one man sin did enter into the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned, for until the Torah, sin was in the world. But sin is not recognized when there is no Torah. But death from sin, obviously, did reign from Adam until Moshe, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam. So how did this sin enter? Well, the prophet Ezekiel answers the question in chapter 28, verses 15 through 17, and I quote, You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created. Hmm, who is he talking about there? Until unrighteousness was found in you. By the greatness of your trade, we'll come back to that in a minute, you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. So I thrust you from the mountain of Elohim, the Almighty Father of lights, who sits in the heavens, the Shamayim, 
and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was lifted up because of your loveliness, your pride. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor, your pride. I threw you down to the earth. Okay, so now we know that Hashatan was thrown down to the earth and sin entered through one man into the world from Hashatan. Okay, that well, looks pretty good. Scripture does indeed interpret Scripture. We go to Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 8, and I quote, And there came to be fighting in the heaven. Michael and his messengers fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his messengers fought, that serpent of old. But they were not strong enough. Hashatan and his messengers were not strong enough against Michael and those messengers that Michael was in battle with against Hashatan and the third that fell to the earth. Nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. Yes, we know that Hashatan was thrown to the earth with one third of the messengers. And that great dragon was thrown out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, Hashatan, who leads all the world astray. Starting off with that first man, Adam. Sin, sin entered in through Adam. Isaiah states it this way, or Yeshayahu. Chapter 14, verses 12 through 15. How you have fallen from the heavens, O Halal, son of the morning. You have been cut down to the ground, you who laid low the Gentiles. For you have said in your heart, let me go up to the heavens. Let me rise, let me raise my throne above the stars of the almighty father of lights who sits in the Shamayim. And let me sit in the mount of meeting on the sides of the north. Let me go up above the heights of the clouds. Let me be like the most high but you are brought down to the grave to the sides of the pit. Yes, Hashatan was thrown down with one-third of the messengers. Yazekiel is backed up uh, further by stating that uh, Hashatan was in Eden, Eden, the garden of Elohim. Revelation 12.9 f- uh, firmly verifies that. And the great dragon was thrown out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was thrown to the earth and his messengers were thrown out with him. Jude or Yehuda uh, chapter 1 verse 6 verifies this further. And the messengers who did not keep their own principality, where they were in the heavens, left their own dwelling. They were thrown out. He has kept in everlasting shackles until dar- under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Yes, the cosmic battle is real and there's collateral damage. People get in the way of this. Young children that have been born into this world, into this corrupt age of man, sometimes through wars are killed. They had no sin upon them. It's collateral damage. Sin causes death to one and all. If you get into this in a very deep manner, uh, the writings of Hanok really provide other details that are very value-added. I, the serpent of old, fear you will not indeed agree to this deed, and I alone shall have to pay the penalty of a great sin. Well, he's trying to influence the fallen messengers, the one-third that followed Satan, Hashatan. And he said, hey, look, I've got this plan. We're going to lead astray the whole world. Yahuwah has given me authority to rule over this corrupt age of man on earth. And are you with me or are you not? And the one-third messengers all answered and said to, to Hashatan, let us all swear an oath and all bind ourselves by mutual imprecations, meaning curses. They were going to give curses to everyone on the earth. They were going to make them sin so they experienced death. And these one-third messengers said, let's not abandon this plan. Let's do it. Let's do this thing. Let's lead the whole world astray. Then swear they all together and bound themselves by mutual curses upon it. Yes, the shisha, the first snake, went against Melchishua, the king of salvation, 
Shisha is the king of death, the king of sin. And Hanok further states, and Azaziel taught men, and this is Shisha, this is Hashatan. And Azaziel taught men to make swords and knives and shields and breastplates. Yes, to war, to kill each other. And made known to them the metals of the earth and the art of working them and the use of antimony, antimony, antimony. What does that word mean? Hmm. Additionally, antimony is used in a variety of military applications, including night vision goggles, explosive formulations, meaning bombs, bullets, missiles, flares, nuclear weapons production, and infrared sensors. This is from the United States International Trade Commission this year. Now you know why some people want to remove Hanuk's writings as well. Antinomy, uh, antim antimony is a heavy concentration uh, which is processed in China and it ensures that a large amount is given to the U.S. It imports and is sourced from China, similar to other critical, critical materials like Reese and cobalt, nuclear warfare. This is why the Olivet Discourse, when the Mashiach Yahushua said in chapter 24, verse 22, and if those days were not shortened, no flesh would be saved, but for the sake of the chosen ones, those days shall be shortened. Again, people are going to push the button. Many will die because of sin. The wages of sin are death, and Hashatan is sitting in power during this corrupt age of man here on earth. He was thrown down. We are caught in the middle of a cosmic battle and we reject truth because of pride. And this is how Mashiach Yahushua will eliminate pride. Again, collateral damage means injury inflicted on something other than an intended target. Specifically, civilian casualties of a military operation. We are in the middle of a military operation. It is a cosmic battle and there is collateral damage to one and all. Even little children that are born into this world within a day or a week experience death because of the wages of sin. Yahuwah never intended this. But why is this happening? Why does Yahuwah allow it still? Well, we get to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. Should any of you holding a matter against another go to be judged before the unrighteous and not before the set-apart ones? Do you not know that the set-apart ones shall judge the world? Separated ones is a better term. And if the world is judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge messengers? How much more matters of this life? Antimony? Again, there is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Hashatan wants you out of the picture because he does not want any human being in the future to judge him. Your potential under Yahuwah and his way, as guided by our mediator, the Mashiach Yahushua, that points us to the Father. Hashatan doesn't want that to happen. Now you know another reason why the writings of Shaul, the emissary Paul, are being attacked. People are attempting to remove this. They don't want you to know about this. Nor does Hashatan. Hashatan uses world religions to get people to reject this. My people have perished for lack of knowledge. Reject Bala to waste it. And thus why these writings are being feebly attempted, if you will, to be removed. No success has happened yet. We cover this in this scriptural study video in greater detail. Who despises Paul and why? Now some people say, well, I don't despise Paul. 
But again, if you despise something, you eliminate it. You put it to waste. At least that's the simple dictionary definition. So again, for the wages of sin is death according to scripture. For all have sinned and all fall short of the esteem of the almighty Yahuwah. The root cause from a scriptural standpoint of death is sin. The symptoms are many. These just happen to be 10 of them. There are many more symptoms, obviously. All because we can't follow the greatest commandment is to love Yahuwah with all our heart, being and mind and how to love our neighbor as ourselves. So, that's the cosmic battle and collateral damage. What is the scriptural second death? Most people aren't aware that there's a second death and when will death be eliminated? Well, we've covered this in a few scriptural study videos, uh, the latest being, are you a scriptural optimist uh, and or a scriptural apocaloptimist? So lots of fun. And if you're positive about the future, it's because you understand the Pasha problem. And the Pasha problem means how world religions rebel against the Mashiach Yahushua that is attempting to give us guidance on how to get back to the Father. So this is very, very important and why this video is entitled The Pasha Problem Proves the True Name of the Son, Yahushua, the ones who cry out to the Father for deliverance. So here we are, we're in the age of man. So in eternity past, Yahuwah, the self-existent one, the only self-existent one, existed. I am that I am. Yahuwah. Then was pre-existence. The firstborn of all creation came to be, which was the Son, the Mashiach, Yahushua. He cries out to his Father for deliverance. He calls out to me, you are my Father, my Almighty One, the rock of my deliverance. And this is why Yahuwah the Father appoints Yahushua, the firstborn, highest of the sovereigns of the earth. He's got a job to do, and it was destined from the very beginning. He's not the Father, but Yahushua is in the likeness of the invisible Almighty Yahuwah. So again, firstborn of all creation with the Father, they create time, space, and matter. That's creation, as we can read in Bereshith or Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, Eob or Job chapter 38 and 39 and Yahukin in chapters 1 verses 1 through 3 etc. And then there's the fall as we already talked about. And here we are in the age of man of self-governance where we have been allowed the human experiment of self-governance under the leadership of HaShatan who's introduced, who introduced and taught people sin. And it's alive and well, regrettably. But there's a purpose behind this. Because at the end of the day, the age of Mashiach is to happen, where Yahushua returns, and he restores all things. This is why we are called scriptural apocaloptimists. <laughs> Hard word to say. So this is where we're at. And Yahushua will clean all things up with his 144,000. Regrettably, the final pieces of prophecy in the age of man, and it shall be throughout all the soil, Zechariah says, and he declares this based on Yahuwah's words, that two-thirds therein are cut off and die. One-third of the remaining population, when that happens, will experience the reign of the Mashiach, Yahushua. They will be ruled with a rod of iron by Yahushua himself and his 144,000. Zechariah further states in chapter 13, verse 9, And I shall bring the third into fire and refine them as silver is refined and try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name. They will cry out to the Father. They will learn from Yahushua why it's so important to cry out to the Father for their deliverance. And Yahushua shall answer them. I shall say, This is my people, why they say, Yahuwah is my Almighty One. One third is left therein. Now, what will happen to those one-third? Well, Yahushua himself stated when he was here in the first coming, in Matith Yahu, gift of Yahuwah, now known today as Matthew, 
chapter 13, verses 41 through 42. Quote, The son of Adam shall send out his messengers, and they shall gather out of his reign. Yahushua is not reigning right now in the age of man, but he will reign as predestined in the age of Messiah, the thousand-year millennium. And he shall gather out of his reign all the stumbling blocks and those doing lawlessness, and shall throw them into the furnace of fire where there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. That's not happening right now in the age of man. It will happen in the thousand-year reign. According to Scripture, if you believe in the full and complete prophetic timeline, Remember, Revelation chapter 1, verse 3, blessed or esher means to set right, to be straight or level. So, the one who is straight and level is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and guard what is written in it for the same, for the time is near. The full and complete prophetic timeline. How many have you been introduced to that cut and paste what they want out of this? They don't look at the full and complete prophetic timeline. And they miss all of this. So, Revelation chapter 20, verse 13 through 14, and I quote, And the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and the grave gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. And the death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Wow. So, sin is being removed. And that sin is being thrown into the lake of fire and all those who choose to remain with the wages of sin, which is inevitably death. This is verified further word for word from the emissary Shaul or Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 26. Please take the time to read it. Yeshayahu, the prophet, or Isaiah, chapter 25, verses 8 through 9. He shall swallow up death forever. That's Mashiach Yehushua. That's what he's talking about. And the master shall wipe away tears from all faces and take away the reproach of his people from all the earth. For Yahuwah has spoken, and it shall be said in that day. See, this is our Almighty One. We have waited for him, and he saves us. This is Yahuwah. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his deliverance. Yahuwah is the only one that delivers. Yahushua is the mediator. He cleans everything up, gets rid of sin, and eliminates death, the last enemy. And then eternity future starts with Yahuwah. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Messiah, Yahushua, Mashiach, he is a renewed creature. The old matters have passed away. See, all matters have become renewed or restored. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 and 19. And all matters are from Yahuwah, who has restored us to favor with himself through his son, Yahushua, Messiah, and has given us the service of restoration to favor. That is, that Yahuwah was in Messiah, restoring the world to favor unto himself, not reckoning their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of restoration to favor. I was taught to become a historicist. And the reason was, was to eventually evolve to becoming a realist, trusting the scriptures, that they were real and true in all matters. When we allowed scripture to interpret scripture, looking at the full and complete timeline, prophetic timeline. So from a historicist to a realist to an eternalist is the goal. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 through 20, Therefore we are on voice on behalf of Mashiach, as through Almighty Yahuwah we're pleading through us. We beg on behalf of Mashiach Yahushua to be restored to favor with the Almighty Father Yahuwah. That's the Son, the firstborn of all creation's job, to restore us to favor with the Almighty Father Yahuwah. That was his predestined Ordainment. That was his job. It's further clarified by the emissary Shaul in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. And I quote, What then shall we say? Shall we continue in sin to let favor increase? Let it not be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? 
Or do you not know that as many of us were immersed into Messiah Yahushua, were immersed into his death? We were therefore buried with him through immersion into death, that as Messiah was raised from the dead by the esteem of the Father. The Son, the firstborn of all creation, Yahushua himself, did not raise himself from the dead. His Father raised him, so raised him from the dead. And this is why Yahushua cried out to his Father for deliverance. Shua means to cry out. It also means deliverance and salvation. So also we should walk in newness of life. For if we have come to be grown together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be also of the resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was impaled with him so that the body of sin might be rendered powerless to serve sin no longer. For he who has died has been made right from sin. These scriptural verses or writings that back up Old Covenant scriptural verses from the prophets reminds me of a movie called The Green Mile where Tom Hanks lives very long he dies but he lives very long but there's a quote in the movie when he's older and he states we each owe a death there are no exceptions and there were no exceptions for the just under 110 billion people that have lived and died before us there was no exception for the Mashiach Yahushua who died for our sins he died for us there has been no exceptions we each owe a death there are no exceptions if you haven't seen this movie, uh, it's it's a great clip, and it seems to remind me of these writings from Shaul and the prophets. We each owe a death; there are no exceptions. I know that, but sometimes the green mile is so long. Romans chapter six, verse twenty-three: For the wages of sin is death, but the favorable gift of the Almighty Father Yahuwah is everlasting life in Mashiach Yahushua our master. That is the good news. That's the glad tidings, the good news of the restoration of all things. So in the description box of this YouTube scriptural study video, we'll have a PDF link with a great study from two Bereans that are just amazing. Uh, Ralph Ward and Craig Peters. Um, I believe one of them is no longer with us. The other uh, may be in the same situation. They have may experience death already. But this article is profound. I've read it now over 50 times, and I continue to read it. This subject, we're only touching the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more, but because people don't believe in the full and complete prophetic timeline, because they add and take away from Scripture, uh, these things are no longer known. They reject knowledge. They make it wasteful. They eliminate it. So uh, check out the description box of this YouTube study and you'll be glad that you did I continue to read this study it's amazing yes this study will really shed some light on Lucas chapter 2 verses 10 through 11 where it states and the messenger said to them do not be afraid for look I bring you good news of great joy which shall be to all people because there was born to you today in the city of Daud a Savior who is Messiah the Master. So again, this scriptural study shows how Yahuwah is the only uh, one, the self-existent one, that has the power to deliver. That's why the Mashiach Yahushua, his firstborn, his son, his firstborn of all creation, cried out to him for deliverance. Shua, he cried out. So this uh, good news of great joy in this study brought to us by Ralph and Craig is huge and it really highlights why the gate is small and the narrow road that leads to life is so amazing and why only a few find it because many aren't positive about the scriptures they mock them and they are not scriptural Apocaloptimists, they don't look at the full and complete prophetic timeline. They become very pessimistic. They don't get up every day trying to prove the scriptures, test and prove them. They get up to just and disprove them. They're very pessimistic. So the pessimist mocks the scriptural winds of change while the realist in time becomes a scriptural apocaloptimist 
who enjoys a confident expectation about the scriptural winds of change and thus trusts the scriptures to adjust his or her sails towards eternity. They think bigger. They don't add or take away. So that's what this article is all about. It's long and it has tons of scriptural witnesses. Each page is laced with 20 to over 50 witnesses. It allows scripture to interpret scripture. It doesn't have the opinions of men and or women. So please take the time to take a look at it because this concludes this scriptural study of the good news of great joy. Yes, there is a cosmic battle going on and there is collateral damage. And yes, each and every one of us will experience the first death. And yes, there'll be people out there that'll tell you they're chosen. It always happened through time. So some of us may get the opportunity to cross over into the millennium. But again, even some of those people will experience the first death. So more studies on that as time goes on, hopefully, uh, who are willing. Because we believe the 144,000 will come out of the 110 billion people that have lived and died before us. And the remaining 8 billion plus, the percentages of that, that's 118 billion people. 144,000 is so small. Please study out the nine criteria that make up the 144,000. It's humbling. But many people state that they're in there like a dirty shirt. But that is not the case based on past history, present day history, let alone future history. But people will make up stuff because it makes them feel better. And this is serious and they know it. There's no get out of jail free card for this. Because why? Scripture says the leading cause of death is sin. It's that simple. And not one of us have lived in the past to the present day free from sin. We have improved. We have done some great improvement. And as we study further as Bereans search the scriptures daily to see if those things are so, with all of the witnesses available, we then apply that knowledge to the best of our abilities. But there are situations where we still can improve. And there will be future situations. If you have a humble heart and a, an approach like a noble Berean that admits that. So there's so much more to learn, but more importantly, and much more difficult, so much more to apply, to eliminate sin from our lives entirely. So as always, we call out, we cry out to the Father Shua that he continues to keep and guard each and every one of us. And until next time, may our only teacher, the Mashiach Yahushua, the one who cried out to his Father for deliverance, be in everything we say and do. Have a awesome day, everyone.